Awesome. Well, I want to say welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Um, it's really wonderful because we've brought together two letterpress communities. Um, funny thing is, is we're all one community. Um, but the Hamilton Hang group is here and also the Learning Letterpress group is here. And we've done one of these calls before and it's really nice that we can all join each other on a Friday. So uh, I want to say hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm at the Hamilton Woodtype and Printing Museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. It's so nice to see so many new faces and um, some familiar ones for me. I'm Dory and I help organize the Learning Letterpress and I am delighted to introduce Rob Keller to the group today. Rob is the Director of Commercial Operations for French Paper, which is in Niles, Michigan. Um, in his current role, he has all customer facing activities, including fun things like this where he gets to hop on Zoom calls with us. He grew up in Western Pennsylvania, received a degree from Carnegie Mellon University in industrial management and graphic communications. He has worked in paper most of his career, including at Williams House Regency doing envelopes and paper and Galfelter. We're delighted to have his um, wealth of knowledge and his time with us. And just as a personal aside, Rob married his high school sweetheart and he has four children and a pup. So we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us, Rob. Great. Thanks, everybody. I'm happy to, uh, to be part of uh, this group and share a little bit of uh, uh, this wonderful world of paper that I've been in for quite a while. So I, I strongly encourage dialogue and questions. I'm really going to hit uh, some high level things here. Uh, there's always uh, more depth to what we can dig into, but certainly um, you know, we just want to touch on that, the, the, the high level stuff. So at any point, please let me know if there are deeper questions, but uh, I'm going to share my screen for the group. Um, and make sure that we're all good. You're all good, Rob. Got a thumbs up. Okay. Fantastic. So as Dory mentioned, I am uh, the director of commercial operations for French paper. Uh, located in Niles, Michigan. And for those of you who don't know where Niles, Michigan is, we're in the lower left-hand corner of the mitten. Uh, we are uh, southwestern Michigan, uh, about uh, 30 miles from Lake Michigan. We're about nine miles north of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, so that puts us very centrally located uh, and, uh, you know, about an hour and a half to the, uh, the west is Chicago. So, so we're in a great location here in the beautiful Midwest. Um, so I've been with the company since December of 2019. So in the brief time that I've been here, we've experienced quite uh, an array of uh, different uh, environments, especially with the COVID, uh, the, the, the COVID virus. So uh, what I plan on doing uh, is walking through, let me uh, just give you a little bit of the agenda here. Uh, so, I'll give you an overview of our organization. Uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the paper making process at a very high level. Uh, I've got some videos to share that uh, we'll talk about. Uh, talk about fiber types and uh, how they actually impact paper. We'll define a couple of things such as basis weight. Basis weight always seems to be a mystery. Uh, to a lot of folks. So again, forgive me if this is a little basic, but I want to make sure that we've got all the audience covered. Uh, and then something that is is unique to uh, to printing and how we make sure that we're able to reproduce images is a triangle relationship in paper. So that's something we'll talk about. And then we'll talk about the print surfaces and then open it up to any questions. All right. So first and foremost, I want to talk about French paper. French paper has been around since 1871. So if you do the math, uh, next year we will be 150 years old. Located here in Niles, Michigan, that entire time started out as the Michigan Paper Box Company uh, and then transitioned into making fine text and cover uh, colored papers in the early 1900s. Uh, the organization was a family-run business for six generations until July of 2019 when the Finch Paper Company out of Glens Falls, New York, acquired French paper. So still to this day, it's a tongue twister for me to say Finch and French. So if I slow down as I'm, uh, uh, as I'm saying those things, you'll have to forgive me. But 
Uh, Finch paper uh, has been around uh, uh, just as long as French paper. Uh, Finch is part of the Atlas Holding Company Group, which is a $5 billion organization. So uh, it provides us a lot of stability. And I will tell you, it was very timely for this, the acquisition of the French paper company, given the COVID environment that we're in. Uh, it would have been very taxing for a small family run business to be able to continue operations through this time period. But given the stability that a larger organization has allowed us, uh, it has allowed us to blossom, quite frankly, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, the Finch French connection provides uh, a, an array of uncoated products from white to black from premium to uh, economy products. So it's something that uh, has allowed the, the, the scale of both organizations and the portfolio of products to be able to expand. It's been a good, uh, good match for both of us. So let me talk a little bit about French. So really what we're known for are specialized color uh, printing and writing text and cover products. We have in our library over 3,500 colors and 2,000 that we're running on a regular basis. If the color's been made, we've probably made it somewhere along the line. We have a great knack to be able to match uh, specific colors, PMS colors, corporate colors, university colors, things like that. So it's one of the things that differentiate us in the marketplace. So let me talk a little, let me move a little bit more here. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're in the southwest corner of Michigan, uh, close to Chicago, South Bend, Detroit. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we do is we make color papers. We've got a single paper machine here uh, that we can match an individual color for as little as 10,000 pounds, which may sound like quite a bit to you all, but is a relatively small quantity whenever it comes to the to the paper world. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, we're running black, which is a very difficult color to achieve. And I, I'm always amazed at the number of different shades of black and the number of different shades of white paper that are out there. It just can't be white or black. There are multiple shades. But, you know, one of the things that we do is we run uh, a black paper run every three weeks. So we're on a schedule that, uh, you know, affords us a lot of availability in that space. Uh, we're our basis weights. We run from 50 pound text up to 18 point cover stock, which is 140 pound cover, or as we'll talk later, is 256 pound text. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We do uh, custom finishes as well. We've got embossed patterns. We've got 14 different embossed patterns. So these patterns are applied after the paper is made. Uh, we've got various sources of fiber that we use. So post-consumer waste, we've got certified fiber from FSC, SFI, and we do use other sources of virgin and recycled fibers. Uh, one of the things that that French does that's very unique is we can add inclusions to our products. So things like hemp, things like uh, uh, grass clippings. We've actually made paper for a golf tournament where they included grass clippings from the course that was being played and we were able to incorporate that into our product. So, you know, quite unique and, uh, and flexible in those capabilities. So I, I think the thing that is most important in all of this and one of the things that drew me to the organization is the sustainability part of it. And when we think about sustainability, I think of it in three ways. So one, you know, the obvious is the environment and we'll talk about that, but the other side is financial and I touched on it earlier, but you know, as an organization, it's important for us to sustain our company for the employees and the families and the communities in which we survive. And, you know, it's important for us and it has always been to the French family to participate in the community, uh, be a good corporate citizen in the area. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Finch organization with their acquisition has certainly allowed us to support that. And with the lo relatively low debt load that, uh, that they manage, uh, it supports our organization from a financial standpoint for 150 more years into the future. 
The community aspect is the second leg of that three three legged stool from sustainability and community both Finch and French are very strongly minded and participate in community events. For example, Niles, Michigan is a town of about 10,000 people. So it means a lot to this community to have an organization like ours and we recognize that. So, you know, we participate in, uh, in supporting local libraries, local um, the local hospital and a number of different events. So we know that that's the, uh, the, the what really matters in the scenario. So we want to make sure that we, we're, we're good corporate citizens and help support our community. The final leg that everybody's more familiar with is the environmental side. So one of the things that really drew me to this organization is the sustainability of the environment that the French family has built into this facility. They did things that made sense and you know not because they were pressured to do something green or anything like that but one of the best examples is we operate we maintain and operate our own hydroelectric facility here where we generate power for our mill uh, a, a number of other mills talk about purchasing wind credits from other other places and are not directly applied to to what they do they're just purchasing the credits well you know thank goodness for the french family in 1921 they installed uh, the hydroelectric dam along the saint joseph's river and it allows us to be sustainable uh, from an electric power generation we own the, we own and maintain and utilize all the power uh, that is created so we are uniquely independent of any uh, of the, uh, the fossil fuel um, power sources. So that's one thing. The second thing is recycled fibers. So recycled may seem like a green type of an issue, but the French family created a grade called Speckletone, and hopefully you're familiar with that. But that was created in 1955 and was created with 100% recycled fiber because it was the right thing to do. There was excess waste that was available. So let's utilize it. Let's make sure that we've got full consumption of the resources that we had. So there's a long history that there's a lot of credit that goes to the French family. Uh, the Finch facility also operates a hydroelectric facility, but it is uh, on a much smaller scale. Uh, and they've got some unique pulping processes that uh, uh, are very friendly. If you've ever been past a paper mill that is making pulp, there is a distinctive odor. Well, one of the advances that Finch has made is that they've found a way to, to, to uh, suppress and eliminate that odor from their process. So, you know, it, both very good corporate stewards. Uh, briefly, just touch on the French products. I don't want to make this a French commercial, but, you know, we've got eight primary product lines that uh, that we manage. Speckletone, as I mentioned before, is one of our original grades. It's very unique and has uh, surface inclusions that make it distinctive. A lot of our products uh, add to the design. So it's not just printing on white paper and you create a design and put it on there. We become part of the design in the products that we're making. So Speckletone with the inclusions, we've got products like uh, Doritone, uh, where we've got different uh, surfaces that add to, uh, to the design as well. Uh, glow tone is one that I will bring up because we are reintroducing a number of new colors. These are the bright neon exciting colors uh, that uh, are very hot right now. We've added three new colors to our line. Two things that don't show up on here are uh, a grade called Royal Tone that we have created that's a 100 pound cover. It has a linen embossed finish and is targeted at the presentation market, uh, presentation folder market. And then our latest addition is a product that contains hemp. So uh, we are in the process of putting some stocking lines on our floor. 15% uh, hemp containing products for packaging for distinctive looks. This will also have a very overt uh, look to the surface where you'll be able to see the fibers uh, and make it a distinctive look. So something we're really excited about. Hey Rob. We yes ma'am. About whether French paper offers any 100% hemp or 100% cotton, cotton sheets. Yeah, we do not uh, process any cotton fiber here. Uh, it takes a very unique and 100% hemp uh, is not a possibility because of the type of fiber uh, that it is. It, it, there have to be other fi fibers that combine with it to be able to make a, a sheet that is 
able to be uh, to go through any type of process. So 100% is we're, we're, nobody's capable of that at this point. Or if they are, they're lying to you. So, <laughs> all right, good questions. All right, so I want to jump to the paper making process, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the paper making process, but I, I drew, I've got a schematic of a paper machine, and I'm going to, if everybody can see the pointer that I have here, um, this is uh, a, 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 um, a schematic of a paper machine, and basically a paper machine is nothing more than a dewatering device. So we take fiber in different combinations, we take fillers, which are our dyes, which are the opacifying agents uh, and other things, sizing that help hold the sheet together. And we add them uh, in, our, um, in our stock preparation area. And we'll show you a few pictures of that. But it comes onto the paper machine at the head box at 99.5% water. That means we've only got a half a percent of solids that come out of the head box. And the head box, much like um, the slice opening, or much like the ink fountain openings uh, on a, uh, a printing press, there is called a slice, and the opening on that controls the amount of material that goes on, which is in effect how you control the basis weight by the amount of material that you're putting onto a wire. And then you've got what's called the Fourgenier table, and that is nothing more than a continuously rotating mesh screen that water drains through. And also there are some other mechanical and physical devices called foils and vacuum boxes that are actually sucking water through this table. So this rotates continuously. It starts at 99.5% water. And as it flows down the wire, it will ultimately come off the wire at 80%. There are a couple of things that I want to talk about what happens on the wire. So you've heard terms such as grain direction and felt versus wire side of paper. So grain direction, uh, imagine uh, logs that are floating in a river, okay? Those logs float in the least resistant way they can, which is the, the, the long and skinny part floats in the direction of flow. Well, wood fibers are, nothing more than little logs. They're, they're small. You can envision them like straws. They're circular. They're hollow in the center. And so they would like to align in the direction of movement. So a grain direction is when the fibers are aligned in the direction of movement of the wire. That's why you get a grain direction. Okay. The other term is felt versus wire. So you can see on this schematic that the fibers come out onto this continuously rotating mesh screen and they're supported from beneath with that wire. So that wire uh, adds as, uh, acts as the support, but what it also does is gravity takes over. So you've got a more preponderance, preponderance of a heavier ingredients that fall to the, the wire side or the bottom side of the sheet. So you've got as a ratio more fibers on the wire side of the sheet than you do on the felt side. The felt side is the upper side that is not contacted at this point until it goes into the press section and the dryers, but a, a higher ratio of your fillers, uh, titanium dioxides, uh, colorants, and things like that will float on top of that felt side. So typically, or historically, the felt side has presented a better printed surface than a wire. I will tell you that the, uh, you know, the advances in um, wire technologies and paper making technologies make the two sides almost indistinguishable these days, but there still is a slight difference between felt and wire side. Okay. So moving on, we leave the wire at 80% water and it goes through a press section. The press section you can envision, for those of you who are old enough, such as myself, that my grandparents had a ringer washer where they would do the wash and they would take the, the, the shirt out and it would go through two, two rollers that would squeeze out water. That's basically what we're looking at here in the press section is we've got 
rollers and felts that are absorbed that squeeze and press out water. So we start at 99.5% water, we leave the wire at 80% water. As it goes through the press section, it is 60% water. Then it goes through steam filled dryer canisters that alternate the sides so it serpentines around, uh, drying both sides evenly uh, until we get it down to about 1% water. It goes through what's called a size press, and we'll see pictures of all of these things, by the way. Uh, that size press adds a starch solution uh, that will give you increased holdout in your paper. It rehydrates it with that water starch solution. It goes through a second set of dryers and ends up at about 5% moisture in total. From that point, it will go through a calendar stack, and a calendar stack is, is basically uh, a number of rolls that are stacked on top of one another that create weight and pressure. So it acts like an iron to level the surface or smooth it out. So here's where we're getting the finished caliper and finished and the, the final surface finish at the calendar stack. So basis weight is established at the head box and caliper and finish are established at the calendar stack. Then it gets wound up onto a large roll and goes on for processing. All right, so I spent a lot of time there. Let's take a look at some of the pictures, right? So I talked about stock prep. So this is where we're mixing all the ingredients. So the first picture I'm gonna show you is one of our beatermen who was taking some dye and adding it to uh, our stock chest where we're mixing things together. I thought this was, uh, was interesting. So, you know, purely it's a, it's a specific measured amount. It doesn't necessarily, uh, look like that, but it is a measured amount that goes in and based on the individual furnish of that material, we're mixing it. You can see that we were making black whenever I took these pictures. And then it goes into the, uh, uh, the beater. So all this is is basically a big blender. So we've got all the ingredients together that we're mixing and stirring. This holds about 5,000 pounds worth of material. It's about 10 to 13 feet deep as it goes around. Uh, and, you know, there's a big agitator blade at the bottom of that uh, pulper. Uh, once we get this blended to the consistency that we want, there is a, uh, a, 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 a chute at the bottom that we open up and it goes into a holding tank to go out to the paper machine. Hey, Rob. Yes, ma'am. While, while you have a pause point, we had a couple of questions come through. Oh, sure, absolutely. Tell us one more time what those newer papers are called, the hemp and the heavier weight paper. Yeah, so our hemp paper will be called hemp tone. So French paper, for some reason, likes the name tone in their name. So we have speckle tone, duratone, pop tone, glow tone. So our hemp product will be hemp tone. And then the presentation folder line, which is a heavier weight linen embossed product, will be called royal tone. So, because right. it goes along with the presentation component. Thank you, Rob. Two more questions. Yes. Whenever you're developing a new paper or a custom paper, what's the time horizon for that? Sure. So, um, if it is purely a color match, what we will do from a process standpoint is we'll take the original color to be matched and we'll work with one of our dye partners. Um, we've got a couple of folks that we work with directly. Uh, we will send uh, the sample to them, they will put together a dye formulation and send back to us um, some hand sheets that are made on an off machine uh, press with that dye colorant so that we can see what it looks like. Once we agree to that, we can, uh, we've got a dye formulation uh, and we can uh, go on to the paper machine. So in the meantime, we're talking about what specifications you need for thickness and caliper, but the dye matching process is a week to 10 days, roughly, we'll give it that. And so, you know, we can develop a sheet, you know, exclusive of our paper machine backlog in probably two to three weeks, whenever it comes to strict color matching. If you've got unique characteristics, because not all of our paper goes into printing, some of it goes into other unique applications, such as packaging, uh, and we may have to design a sheet with specific strength characteristics uh, that may take a little bit more trial and error uh, until we get to a finished product. So, you know, we, we, we've got developments that take two to three weeks and developments that take six to 12 months. Right, and then last question, how old are your Fortinier machines at French and where does that name come from? 
So Forgeneer is named for the developers, the Forgeneer brothers. They created this style of paper machine. And I can't, I, I'd be lying to you if I told you the dates of when they did that, but it is based on the family name of the Forgeneer brothers. Uh, the, the French paper machine was rebuilt within the last decade. So you could say the framework has been around for a hundred years, uh, but the components have been adapted within, uh, within the last decade. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So let's take a look at that paper machine. So as talked about, here is the head box. So this is where all the material comes out. The wire will be rotating in this direction. Uh, I'm going to play it a couple of times because there will be a few things that I want to point out. So uh, basically what we're seeing is you can see the stock flow coming out and going down the wire. And you can see water draining here. Foils, as I mentioned, vacuum boxes, and then going down the wire. So that wire perspective wise is about 30 yards in length. Okay, so that I hope that gives you a little bit of perspective. And we're looking at our machine is about 107, 108 inches wide. So that's the width of the paper machine. So if I go back and play this again, I wanna point out a couple of things. You see the shake that is on the paper machine. You see how the wire is, is moving back and forth. I mentioned that, that the fibers try to align in the direction of movement. Well, if all the fibers aligned in that one direction, we wouldn't have strength in the cross machine direction. So what we try and do, that's called the shake. We're trying to break up those fibers so that they would make a matrix of fibers that are uniquely square would be the ideal term that we would like to have. So what we're trying to do is to take advantage of the grain direction. We're breaking up the shake. But then the other thing I'll point out is these are plastic foils that are scraping the bottom of that wire and extracting water. We've got actual vacuum boxes here that suck water out of the fiber. So remember, 99.5% water whenever it comes out of the head box. As it goes down through here, we're removing water until it leaves the wire at 80% water. Okay? Again, a paper machine is nothing more than a dewatering device. And you can see the wire rotating down here. So it's just one continuous loop. All right, so let me uh, move on. So beyond, at the end of the wire, we've got what's called, whoops, wrong screen. We've got what's called a dandy roll. And a dandy roll, you can add various elements to that. If you've ever heard of a watermark paper, if you add a raised image onto this, because this is also a mesh roll, if you would add a raised image, it would impress into the sheet a light spot that creates the ultimate watermark. So the dandy roll is where that would be added. So this is the first time the upper side of the sheet or the felt side would be uh, touched by anything, okay? And then what I wanted to point out here is that we are, this is what's called the cooch roll. This is the end of the wire and the product, the paper can sustain itself at 80% water and it, it will then be pulled into the press section. So let me play that for you. A little slow here, there we go. So you can see it being pulled from the wire right here and then it goes into the press section, which is the ringer washer section. All right, so the next place is, so Envision, we've gone through the press section, now we've gone, we're, I'm gonna show you the dryer canisters, but this first section shows you the size press. This is where we're adding a starch solution, and you'll see there's a puddle of material here that is going to be absorbed into the sheet and squeezed into the sheet, and this goes through the dryer. So I'm gonna play this for you. So you can see the, the, uh, the starch material here, and then these are the steam filled dryer can. We're actually going in the, the backwards direction here, but I wanted to give you that perspective. You can see these dryer canisters and we generate the steam for those uh, internally as well. 
Okay. So as we come out of the dryer section, go through the size press, we go through the calendar stack. So you can see multiple rolls, one, two, three, are stacked upon one another. And this is acting as the iron to give us our finished uh, caliper and finish. So these rolls are riding on one another, adding weight and pressure, and it will give us our finish. All right. And then finally, we get to the end of the pro oops, the end of the process, which we're winding a reel. Now, envision that we're making um, 108 inch wide paper, and the machine speed is about 500 feet a minute on this particular machine. Uh, I've been in with companies that are running 3,000 feet a minute. So, you know, there, there are various speeds that can go into this. Uh, paper machines can come in, ours is 108 inches wide. Uh, there are machines out there that are 350 inches wide, so three times the width of this. So our paper at 500 feet a minute, we're making about 100 pounds of paper a minute. So you ask why we have a minimum of 10,000 pounds whenever it comes to making a specific color. Well, 10,000 pounds can go through this machine very quickly. And so it's very difficult to make small quantities of less than what would be one beater full, two beater fulls uh, worth of product to be able to get on the machine. Now, the unique thing that I've always been astounded by on the paper machine is it never shuts down. So on a printing press, when you have a web break or you, you have to, to change something, you stop the machine. Well, this machine continues to rotate and we feed this web of paper through it at machine speed. It's an amazing thing to see and something I'm always astounded by. So the final picture that I will show from a machine is this is the winder that is at the end of the reel. So once we take this reel off, that each one of these is going to weigh somewhere around 5, 000, 35 to 5,000 pounds, 3,500 to 5,000 pounds. Then we've got to cut it into usable components. So this is a winder and under here, there are knives that are in the shape of discs that we will set at various widths and we will cut the width of that product. So these can either go out as finished rolls or they can be then move on to a sheeting process where we would cut them into finished sheets. Okay. We've had a couple of machine questions come through. The first uh, is, absolutely. how do you clean the beaters between dyes? Yeah, so there, there's a lot of water used in the process. So, you know, the, the, what we do, the beaters are made of of stainless steel so you know the the colorants don't adhere to them so that we don't stain the beaters whenever they are going through so basically all we do is we will rinse them out and we'll, we'll you know we've got brushes that we can scrub and and uh you know it's a pretty liquid process so it, it, it's fairly easy to clean but it does involve a lot of water great what is the full length of yep. the machines you showed a really long picture I did, yeah. So, so the machine itself uh, is, let me think about this, is about 75 yards long, our particular machine. So each machine is unique, obviously, but this machine itself is, is about 75 yards long. And then how many hours a day are you guys making paper? So a traditional paper making operation runs seven days a week, 24 hours a day. French is a little unique because of the specialization that we have. Uh, so we're typically running um, five days a week. So we'll run three shifts. It's not something that is, if, if you're operating in an integrated paper mill, we are not integrated, which means we don't make the pulp here. Another term that you, you may have heard. If you are in an integrated mill, uh, you've got to shut things down stepwise and it takes about three days to shut the entire process down and to restart it. So it doesn't make sense to um, shut it down. You know, our operation being non-integrated, we we've become very good at taking our machine down after a, a, a week's period. So it's, it, it's something that is very unique and something that is unique to the paper industry because whenever um, you know, there is a situation like COVID or just general secular decline in volumes, they don't just 
don't uh, run the machine part time. They actually take machines offline completely. So you've seen that from Domtar has made an announcement recently of 720,000 tons of paper that is coming out of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. To put an envision or to to put a perspective on that, that's about 36 French papers. So it's it's quite a big volume that Domtar is taking up. That's great. Um, and just something to keep in mind, we've had a couple of people ask about any educational resources, especially while students are working from home. So any videos or resources that you might have, if you could pass those along, we'll be happy to help distribute them. So I, I will tell you that I'm doing a, uh, a, a virtual paper mill tour uh, for a group of students at Western Michigan in the next coming weeks. So I'll be working on something. So once I get that, I'll certainly pass that along to this group. I'm not, it's not quite there yet. Thanks so much. Absolutely. All right, so let me continue. So let's talk about fiber types. So, you know, I mentioned the paper machine is nothing more than a dewatering device. So the recipe or furnish that goes into a paper is really what determines what it is. So that's the mixing of the ingredients. So they're basically, and there are more details to this, but I'll keep it at a very high level. There are basically three types of fiber out there. There's hardwood fiber, which comes from deciduous trees. Those are the trees that lose their leaves in the fall. And these are the hardwood fibers show up in this microscopic picture in the upper left. So they're bundles of fibers that are relatively short and stout. So what they do is they add bulk and smoothness to products. The second type of fiber is softwood. And softwood fibers come from coniferous trees or your evergreens, pine trees. And these fibers are about, in, in the illustration here, about three times the length of a hardwood. So if you're looking for a, a sheet that requires a lot of strength, there's going to be a higher percentage of softwood fibers in that sheet so that it, it gives the, that mesh bonding uh, or mesh matrix of fibers uh, will be much stronger, okay? The third uh, is, is generically I'll label as recycled. It can be PCW, post-consumer waste, pre-consumer waste. It can be post-industrial waste, whatever all those different terms might be. But that comes from the urban forest, which is what I've got pictured here. Uh, this is a collection of fibers that we'll use in our process. And recycled fibers are largely unknown, right? Because it really depends on what the previous use was, how much of it was collected. Uh, so the per percentages of hardwoods and softwood are much less clear and there's much more variability whenever it comes into the recycled, adding recycled fiber to the product. The other thing that is unique is the dirt content that is contained, as well as, you know, the, the claim is a fiber can be recycled four to five times before it becomes so small that it just falls out of the process. So, you know, it, it recycled is, is, is good for the environment. Uh, we're supportive of it. We, we, uh, and uh, French obviously does a good job of adding, you know, we've got a number of 100% post-consumer waste grades, uh, recycled components, it's good for us and we want to be able to use it, but it adds a little bit more variability because you just don't know what that initial fiber is going to look like. Okay, so that gives you a little perspective on fibers. So let's talk basis weight. This to me it was the mystery of the paper world, right? So people talk about 24 pound bond and 60 pound text and they're the same thing. Well, how can that be? You know, we'd look at different things. So what is basis weight? And in its simplest form, Basis weight is the weight in pounds of one ream of paper, which is 500 sheets, in its basis size. So you've got to know what the basis size you're talking about to be able to determine what that basis weight is. So in this case, we've got one ream, 500 sheets of 25 by 38, which makes it a book or text size product. That block of paper will weigh 70 pounds. So that's how you determine basis weight. If it were heavier, which would mean there's more material, those same 500 sheets would weigh, if it were an 80 pound sheet, it would weigh 80 pounds. Well, the next question is, well, how come we have 80 pound text and we have 80 pound cover? They're both 80 pounds, but why does one seem heavier than the other? Well, 
That's because with the, uh, the, the onset of all different types of printing through the years, starting with Gutenberg, uh, people designed their paper to fit their end use. So book or text paper was 25 by 38 because books were made in a six by nine format. So you get eight sheets out of, eight six by nine sheets out of 25 by 38. Bond paper is much smaller. It was 17 by 22 because somebody wanted a stationary. Well, four eight and a half by 11 is equal 17 by 22. So that's why because of the difference in basis sizes, that a, you've heard that 24 pound bond is the same as 60 pound text because it is purely the two different basis sizes that allow for the differences. So that's how in the same vein, an 80 pound text is not as heavy and bulky as an 80 pound cover because the cover size is only 20 by 26. So it's only 520 square inches, which is roughly 55% of the area of what the 25 by 38 is. So that's how that can be very confusing. We could solve all of this if we went to the metric system and we went to grams per square meter because a gram is a gram and a meter is a meter. So that could simplify things very easily. And what I've done here is provided a little bit of a, uh, or, or a uh, conversion factor that would allow you to make that transition between these two products. But this can be very tricky to those who are new or not necessarily familiar with paper in general. So I wanted to spend a little time with that. Okay. All right, let's carry that one step further. So we talked about basis weight. You know caliper is the thickness of the single sheet of product, but there's also the component of finish. What's an antique finish? What's a vellum finish? What's a smooth finish? And how do they interact with one another? And how can they all be the same basis weight? Well, there's a rule in paper making that cannot be broken. Uh, it's the triangle relationship. And the triangle relationship says that you can't change one of those three characteristics without impacting at least one of the other two. So for instance, if I wanted a 70 pound antique finish, that's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about a seven caliper, seven point caliper. If I wanted to make that a smooth finish, but keep the same basis weight, Keep in mind, going back to the paper machine, you've got the basis weight that's set up at the head box, and you've got the caliper that's set up at the calendar stack that is basically a big iron. So if I want to take the same basis weight and I want to make it smoother, so you can't change one without affecting at least one of the others, so keep basis weight consistent, make the finish smoother, that means I'm going to have to squeeze that paper and make it thinner to be able to put the same material into a smoother surfaced finish, okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of explanation how you can have different, uh, different thicknesses and different finishes with the same basis weight, okay? All right, let me keep going here. Uh, in, in our pre-call, we talked a little bit about paper permanence, so I just wanted to share this with you. Paper permanence, how long is paper uh, last, how long will the colors last? And there's a big varying definition of those types of things, but it all stands under paper permanence. And the end use is really what determines, you know, what you have from a permanent standpoint. But generally speaking, permanent paper is that paper that is alkaline based or greater than 7.0 or said another way is acid free because paper makers up until the 70s, most of their paper making processes used an acid based sizing. So paper was less than uh, seven on the pH scale. Well, we transitioned to, uh, to sulfate, I believe is the term, alkaline based products uh, that have pHs greater than seven. So there's the, the, the sizing material that holds the product together and gives you holdout is greater than 7.0. The second component is it's lignin free. So that means it can't have groundwood contained in it. And I didn't really talk about groundwood papers and uncoated free sheets and things like that. But generally speaking, free sheet paper means that you've extracted all of the things in the pulping process, you've extracted 
all of the glues or lignin that hold those fibers together in a chemical cooking process. So you get about a 50% yield of fiber from a tree. Ground wood basically is like putting a carrot into your food processor. They grind everything up. So all the glues and lignins that are contained <clears throat> in the paper, excuse me, stay with it. And, but those glues and lignins are contaminants and they will make your paper yellow. So if, again, those of you who are old enough to remember newspapers, um, if you leave a newspaper out on the front porch, it turned yellow overnight, and that was because it was made of brown wood and had lignin-containing material in it, all right? The third general guideline for permanent paper is that it has a calcium carbonate reserve. Calcium carbonate uh, is basically limestone. It's a rock, right? But what it does is it absorbs uh, the outside environment. So uh, you've got a reserve of calcium carbonate, usually at least 2% that's in there that will help act like a sponge to the outside environment and help uh, keep your paper from turning different colors. And then the final characteristic, which is near and dear to us at French because we're making colored paper is dye-based colorants versus pigment-based. Pigments are permanent, dyes are uh, can fade over time. We predominantly use dye-based technology here for our products, but things that might go into uh, framing mats or things that could go onto artwork like that may have additional um, permanence uh, characteristics and they would use pigment-based colorants in that process. All right, I think I just have a couple more slides. Here's the part that you all are familiar with, right? So I just wanted to share the different methods of printing and how they might impact paper. So letter presses, raised type, you're all familiar there. Flexography is raised type with a flexible plate used in, uh, in packaging, envelopes, a lot of different industries. Gravure, you may or may not be as familiar with. Gravure, instead of a raised image, it has a recessed cell where ink is like an ink well, where uh, uh, the ink will be, uh, will, be, will be applied to the gravure roll and the excess will be scraped off at the, the, plane of, uh, the, the planographic level. And then those ink wells will then transfer. This is very much used for long run packaging material. They, so Chiquita banana, the uh, little sticker that's on uh, the bananas that's the same image, it's a static image that doesn't change and it repeats over and over again. They'll use a reviewer process to be able to print that. And then you have traditional offset lithography, which is a planographic method that uses uh, oil and water dust and mix that will transfer onto a rubber blanket, since, hence the offset side of things, uh, and the, the rubber blanket will be what touches paper. Uh, today, you've got new technologies in digital, such as inkjet, that are putting out your images using electric pulses and dyes. Uh, so it, there, it's a non-contact uh, form of printing uh, and it allows for variable images and that's the attractive part. You can question you know, advances in technology and all of these, but they've all improved over the years. So each one of these has a different impact on paper because you know, one, you've got pressure that's applied in the, letter, in the letterpress You've got uh, gravure that is requiring a smoother surface to be able to extract those voids. You've got offset that is more ubiquitous. And then you've got the ability for these liquid type dyes and their absorption into the sheet. All right, final slide. So very rudimentary. This is a printing surface and how it might react. So the end use has a lot to do with the type of finish that you want to use. The design has a lot to do with what you want to use. So each product in each paper has a specific purpose, but purely from a dot reproduction standpoint, which printing is an illusion of dots, which we've, we've sh uh, tried to demonstrate here, and I'm sure you've all seen that. So the more accurate the representation of that dot, the better and sharper the printed image will be. So if you take a look at a microscopic view of uncoated antique finish. You can see these are the fiber mat that I talked about, and you can see it's very rough on a microscopic level. So I've tried to demonstrate that here with a, a cross-section view of a rough surface and then a printed ink dot. So you can envision that ink dot trying to capture and reproduce itself on an uneven surface. 
So antique papers are not going to give you the finest print quality when you're talking about half tones and things like that, but it may present you a different advantage from a, uh, in, in a letterpress standpoint, it gives you a, a, a bulkier surface, certainly gives you something to absorb the ink as well as the pressure of the letterpress. All right. So here's a, a, a view, a microscopic view of an uncoated smooth sheet. You can see that the fibers have gone through the calendar and have been more absorbed. So they are much flatter. Uh, and again, so you can see how the dot would be reproduced there and then a coated uh, same version. We've got an uncoated sheet underneath that you apply basically paint to the surface to make a level surface and you would get the best dot reproduction. So that's why high quality images uh, for design uh, and museums and things like that are always done on coated type products. Okay, uh, I've ran through a lot at a high basic uh, at a high level. Uh, probably more than you needed to know, but I at least want to offer the opportunity for questions at this point. Rob, we had two more questions that came through the chat. Great. Is the wastewater recycled? I'm sorry? Is the wastewater recycled at French? Absolutely, and it is at all paper mills because if you'll notice, all paper mills are located on a large water source because it requires quite a bit of paper. If you can envision 99.5% water, if we make you know, 15, or, or if we're making 150 tons of product, that means you need an infinite amount more of that in water. So we treat water coming into the facility and we also treat it going back out of the facility. And now some of it obviously goes out in the paper because it's 5% moisture, uh, but we do reuse as much of that water. It's called white water internally because of you know it, it, it has a, a, a tint basically whatever dye you're using but we do reprocess that and then it will go back out into the water source once we've cleaned it and uh, and used it thank you mm -hmm. and with regards to dyes what are the shortest and longest lasting dyes oh that's that chemical technology is probably beyond <laughs> <laughs> this to ask. But they, they do have different lives and, and, you know, just like, and I would suggest that they go along with your expenses and similar inks. So, you know, that yellow dyes and pigments typically are a little more expensive. So I, I think you, you're going to see those types of things in your, uh, in your longevity as well. So I, I can't give you a specific answer to that, just a high level. Thank you. <laughs> I think we have, um, it looks like about five more minutes of our time Great. together. Does anyone from the audience have a question? Please just pipe up if you do and make sure you're not on mute. I was wondering if, uh, if you've got sheets bigger than 26 by 40, Rob. Um, we have the capability of making sheets larger than 26 by 40, but our largest stocking size uh, is 26 by 40. And therefore, you'd have to have uh, a multi-carton order or something like that? Yeah, what we like to see is for a different size is about 2,000 pounds. So, okay. yep. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What's typically the um, grain direction of the parent sheet? So the grain direction is always the second number. So if you have 25 by 38, that means it's a grain long sheet. So if you would see a carton that was 38 by 25, then your grain direction would be short. That is universal in the paper industry. I have a question. I'm wondering if you have um, any interesting anecdote about a really interesting job you did for a custom client work. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, uh, let me see how I want to phrase it if I want to use the, the name. So yeah, so <laughs> yeah. we had a development when I worked for a, a former company uh, to match a corporate color, which happened to be Victoria's Secret. And so uh, Victoria's Secret was, uh, they have a very unique pink product. And the printer was incapable of consistently making that pink product. So they came to us to see if we could make a, a pink uh, coated bag for the end use of bags. Uh, and uh, very quickly, and when we talk about 
quick turnaround. This was within 10 days. We had developed, agreed upon, and produced uh, the pink product. Now that involved a trip to their head, the limited headquarters in Columbus, uh, to the Victoria's Secret headquarters, and I was happy to be on the development team. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, I have a question. Are any of the specialty uh, traditional French papers available for uh, digital printing, for short run traditional digital printing? Yes, yeah, so, so all of the products are used successfully on, uh, I will call it most digital applications. The one area uh, that is still uh, an issue is in the indigo process. So we have, uh, we're working towards some qualification on indigo, then, you know, that's one of my objectives and it'll probably be six months out before we've got indigo qualification. But it's used daily on, you know, inkjet and things like that, so. Oh, I'm talking about traditional print, print through my printers. Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Great, yep. great news, thank you. You betcha. <laughs> um, is the printing or is the paper making process using cotton fibers very different from uh, using wood fibers? And is that why, I guess I'm wondering why doesn't French offer rag and is yeah. it a totally different process? Uh, it, it's, it's not totally different. I mean, the foundations are still true, but because the cotton fiber, there, there, there's some uniqueness whenever it comes to the cotton fibers as far as their length. And they also have uh, the shapes of them have some, we'll call them hooks that, that, that go into uh, the fiber. Uh, it requires special uh, refining equipment <clears throat> and then a uh, different type of uh, dewatering uh, technologies on the wire. But generally, I mean, they're made on four junior paper machines every day, but it's the, the pre-work and then the actual drainage that goes into the, making the cotton. So it, it, it would require a significant investment to be able to do that. And then um, where is the, where does French get their uh, pulp? Yeah, so what we do is, is we've got partners within the paper industry that are producing pulp. And like most things these days, transportation is the key consideration. So we're trying to uh, uh, source things as close to the facility as possible, both for you know, carbon footprint reasons, as well as uh, economic reasons as well. So Finch has real. I will tell you that Finch, uh, the partnership there has given us a little bit more scale and it has benefited uh, the French paper mill from a, uh, uh, an accessibility standpoint for fiber as well. Nice. Oh. Yep. One more? Yeah. 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 I mean, French has been known for decades for your extremely cool promotional pieces and ads, the inserts in the design magazines and everything. Mm -hmm. Still doing those? Or... Yeah, so, so we've taken a little pause, obviously. I mean, you haven't seen anything recently because we're, we're trying to evaluate a couple of things. One is, in, you know, I'll, I'll be brutally honest, it says those are really cool design pieces. What do they do for us? Can we monetize that at all, right? So that's the first question. So design for the sake of design is, is one of the questions. Uh, two, uh, it is what French is known for. And so I think we will ultimately uh, return to some form of that. We're just making the strategic decisions right now. Do we pivot on the types of design work? Because we, we, you know, we had a very distinctive design style with our designer. So we're looking and expanding uh, our, our design choices at this point in time. And I think, you know, we've got to be respectful to the past, but we also want to show something that's new moving forward. Thank you. Absolutely. I think that was a great question because we're all a fan of the paper and also the print promo. So it's a really nice yeah. like marriage. We know you for both. So Rob, that was really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. all of that information. Yeah, uh, my, I have a my pleasure. Yeah, I have a page of notes and I'm sure many people out there do as well. <laughs> so we want to, yeah, thank you. I uh, have a feeling you're going to have lots of people interested in those educational aspects as well, because it really helps us share with our students. 
Yeah, we're, we're happy to share. I mean, this is, uh, this is what we do. This is our passion every day. And if I can share that, I would absolutely love to do so. Yeah, well, thank you. This was a really, really great part. I know you've um, let us know a lot, so thank you. And thank you all for joining us. I'm so glad that we get to see you guys so often. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dory, uh, that Learning Letterpress and Hamilton Hang could come together was really great. Um, I do want to say thank you so much for everyone who helps make these possible. If you haven't become a Hamilton member, it's a really wonderful way to help support this kind of programming and when we do more programming like this. So I appreciate it because I know a lot of the faces on this call are members. So I want to say thank you.